Hi everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, and Chris and Nancy, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Hello. I guess who's who? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Nancy Desmond from Memory Web. Nice to meet you. And I'm Chris Desmond with Memory Web. We want to thank everyone for watching our Roots Tech videos. We had a really good time putting them together and we're thrilled with the response to them. And so we decided we should do a follow up, uh, unlock the shoe box for all of your questions that didn't get answered. Uh, we had quite a number of people registered for this. Um, there will be a replay if you miss part of it or you want to watch it again there'll be a replay for the next five days uh i've asked in the chat um for you to tell us where you're from and i just want to say so far the person from the furthest from where i live and chris and nancy lives is Anne from aberdeenshire scotland if i pronounce that correctly Anne, that's a long thing with lots of syllables <laughs> um, a lot of people from the local area for me, I'm in Rhode Island, several people from Massachusetts, Chris and Nancy are in Chicago. And we have a short presentation, sort of a recap of the three sessions. Then we have some questions and we have your questions. We imagine this will last, well, it can last for as long as you need it for to last, but we imagine about 30 minutes. Uh, we'll be able to answer your questions and do the recap. All right, so this is Ask Us Anything from Unlocking the Shoebox, Digitizing, Identifying, and Organizing Your Family Photos. And without further ado, oh, one little bit of housekeeping. So you can certainly put your questions in the chat. And you can put them over here in the chat, but also at the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question button. So you can actually click that and ask a button, ask a question and vote on your question. Vote for which, which one, um, which question you would like to pop to the top. A lot of slide questions today, Chris and Nancy. Oh boy. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we jump right in? All right, let's do this. Here. here we go. Here we go. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, it's a brief recap of the sessions, a Q&A from submitted questions, and then those of you that have asked questions live. Okay. All right, Chris, you're up. Digitizing recap. So we have a lot of questions even coming in from this, but we talk about best practices of photos and scanning. And that's usually the first step. Uh, a lot of folks talked about how they're inheriting uh, shoeboxes full of photos or, or, or magazines of slides. And the, the, the most important thing is to digitize and digitize in the highest resolution. So there's lots of different file formats. Uh, most common one that most people go to is a JPEG image, but TIFF is usually a better one for long-term preservations. And when it comes to tools for enhancing, well, there's a lot of things um, that one could use, um, such as VividPix, Restore. There's other, you know, softwares out there too. But when it gets to that process, I think it's really important for me, and, and that's why you see on the slide, is whenever you can organize your stuff prior to digitization so that they're either in groups or in dates or something that allows them so when they come back, you're able to kind of group and sort them for easy tagging, to me, is a, is a key point. Right. So takeaways and digitizing. So we just talked about sorting in groups. Keep the negatives. So some folks, you know, I, I don't know about you, Maureen, but I get the question of, would you rather me scan the actual eight by 10 photo or the negative of that photo? My answer to that is scan the negative if you can, if you have the ability to do that, especially when you have those 1970s and 80s and 90s images where they're printed on sort of the linen-based paper, they're very blurry uh, and you can't really enhance them. I've tried with my Heritage and Vivipix. They just don't enhance to the quality that I would like. But when you scan the negative, it's a whole different thing. And I also find, Maureen, that when you take your uh, negatives in to, let's say, your local uh, photography store that you used to bring your, your negatives in in the first place, and you have them put it to uh, CDs, 
they're already grouped in the roles that they were taken on. So that's another benefit. And you get the highest resolution possible when you have the negative compared to like say an eight by 10 printout because you're using the original source. So to me, negatives are, are gold when it comes to digitizing. Right, and my scanner, which is an Epson V-series scanner, has an attachment uh, so that I can scan slides and I can scan negatives. I will say you just have to be careful with it because as I discovered, uh, I scratched the glass on my scanner, so now I have to look for a new one. Um, but there are other types of negative and slide scanners out there on the market. If you go to B&H Photo, for instance, uh, that's a good uh, reputable company for buying equipment from and you can look at all the different slide and negative scanners that they carry and then read the reviews by photographers about which one works but yes I would I'm rambling but yes keep the negatives yeah and the, uh, the thing with slides to me is like uh, so I don't know if people know this but Nancy and I are married and so <laughs> Nancy, <laughs> big secret, <laughs> Chris. In the same office, same house. Um, it wasn't as if we we're at same the, last name. <laughs> same last name. Just want to break the ice with everybody on that one. And so one of the things that um, Nancy's mom passed and she had all of her mom's travels from all over the world. We're talking thousands and thousands of slides. I do not have the patience to digitize every one of those personally, but we actually used a company called Scan My Photos and they did a phenomenal job and we paid extra Maureen to have the DPI increase. So we actually, from the slides, we got it at 4,600 DPI, which to me, anytime you could pay extra to get higher DPI, it's like one of the best investments because these are your photos and your stuff. And if you can make sure you get the best resolution back, you could do so much more with it. So that was a project to me where I actually used a third party versus doing it ourselves. I actually recommend people use a third party because scanning the slides takes forever mm -hmm. and it's so much easier to just send them off and they come back uh, as long as you do the highest resolution that you can. So I agree, I agree with you completely. I mean, there are people who de are determined to do it themselves, and that's fine, but I just don't have the patience for it. Neither do we. No. <laughs> yes. Totally with you. Okay, so this is my recap where I talked about clues for identifying photographs, and I talked about different types of clothing that people wear and wore and for what purposes the different photo formats from daguerreotypes of the 1840s and 50s to tintypes to paper photographs, how to research the photographer a little bit and how important that is. Uh, and then always watch for props in a photograph because you never know what the little clue is going to be that's going to tell you what you need to know to identify that photograph, like the man's hat in little Joe's picture. And this is a, this was a great story because this is a photo Maureen that we, we sent over to you because Nancy and I bought this out of an antique shop and we were just curious about the backstory. And you actually have a whole blog written on this one, which I thought was awesome because you found out everything and even connected the photo to some existing family members, which we thought was so cool. Very cool. It was very cool. Yeah, it's an amazing story. So the three key takeaways from the identifying is, of course, watch for the clues both inside the photograph, on the photograph, front and back, but also clues that might, in your family re history research, that might relate to the picture clues. And then I talk about my signature five to solve the mystery, which is the who, what, where, when, and why of a picture. Who's in the picture? Who took it? What are they wearing? What are they doing? Where was it taken? When was it taken? And why was it taken? Sometimes you can add up all the clues and get to that why. And I advise everyone to tell the story of that picture, write it down some way, one picture at a time, or groups of pictures to tell the story of a person's life, and then preserve it for the future. Because if you don't, you're just going to pass it on to the next generation with the same mystery. Uh, and, or it'll end up in the trash, unfortunately. So don't let that happen. Yeah, no. So on to part three, this was the last part of our three part series. And that was the part where you've already 
scanned all your info or your photos. And then at that point, you've identified whatever clues you have and have captured that information somehow so that you're then able to add it digitally. And so this part, we gave some tips on how to actually take your digitized photos and um, get them ready to use elsewhere, whether you're putting it onto, let's say, a, a storage platform like Dropbox or using a photo organizer like MemoryWeb or other um, photo organizers to be able to create albums and add tags and use all those details that you identified and capture for those photos and put them in a format digitally so that now that information can travel with your photos no matter where it goes, just like the handwriting on the back of the photo, the metadata works like the digital equivalent of, equivalent of that. Um, and then we also talked about some sharing tools um, for enjoying your family, um, your photos with your family and future generations, including a newer tool that some of you may or may not have been aware of called Collectionaire, which is a really cool system that lets you aggregate um, you know, from all the different places that you may have albums and um, photos and be able to kind of create an index that's organized by an interactive family tree, whether it's a person or maybe even a couple, you'd be able to see all those great albums and assets associated with them. And I know Maureen even did a podcast um, on that platform um, pretty recently as well. Yeah, I had Stan on talking about Collection Air. Yeah, it's really cool. So it's can, a very can, cool platform. It, it really is. Um, and so some of the key takeaways that um, we presented in part three were use a nested folder system. Um, there's no one right way to do that. You can organize them at the highest level by date, or you can do it by family. What really, um, you choose whatever really works for the types of photos that you have, just make sure it's really flexible and it works for now. And then also will work to accommodate other photos that you have in the future, including the ones you take today, not just your historical photos. Um, and then um, we talked about organizing with tools and platforms that let that information, if you do take the time to add captions and tag people and dates and things like that, especially with scanned photos, they're not going to have any of that information or they'll have incorrect information like the scanning date. Um, if you use a platform like a photo organizer that lets you uh, tag details as metadata, then um, you know, you're going to be able to make sure that when those photos leave the platform, that the rich information will come with it um, and stay with it forever. And then we also talked about some sharing sites that um, kind of um, warnings or just things to take in mind that if you use um, platforms like Facebook, they're fantastic. They're really, really great platforms for like building a family um, uh, group where you can share photos and try to gather information. And those you should definitely take advantage of, but just know that anything that you put up in some of those platforms, at least currently, um, the photos will be compressed and even the metadata, if you were to add some things to um, the photo, may not come out of the platform. So just evaluate those carefully. And we also, in the presentation, gave you a link to a, um, a photo file that would really encourage you to try out. And it has every piece of the most common metadata that you would ever even consider putting into a photo. And so you can use that and you can upload it to the different platforms or places you're evaluating and see how they treat it. Do they read it? Um, do they let you edit it? And does that information actually come back out in your file when you're done? Good recap. Thank you. So we had some questions that came in ahead of time. So we went ahead and put some of these together for each of the areas, and then we were going to answer the questions that we got today live. I'll take number one. Black paper albums. Oh my God. <laughs> it's uh, a very interesting situation when someone comes up with a black paper album because the first instinct is to take all the pictures off the black paper. But I advise people not to do that because uh, there's 99% of the time there's nothing on the back and it's certainly not worth destroying the entire album and the context of all of those photographs. So when you look at a photo album, you can actually sort of read it like a book if you follow the clues. And someone really put those photographs in, on that black paper with intent and purpose is how I like to refer to it. I recommend that you photograph or scan the entire page first, uh, but I'd never recommend that you take the photos off the black paper. Um, it's just, you just destroy the context of it. So I'm not going to tell you how to do it, 
<laughs> because <laughs> I don't want you to do it. <laughs> in May, I think I'm offering, I think it's May now, I've scheduled, uh, be on the lookout, I'm offering a masterclass and it'll be a live masterclass on dealing with albums and you can ask all your questions and show what you got and what the issues are. Um, it's a hands-on workshop. Hmm? One of the things I've done is like I would take a, a photo of the entire page, yep. but then I would take another photo that be as close as possible to each individual photo. So you get a higher resolution for the individual photos as well. Is that Absolutely. That's what you should do. Absolutely. I, I remember you said that once on a podcast. It just, I, I did. Who was <laughs> listening to my podcast? <laughs> yeah. I think number two should be Maureen. Too, I think right? so also. Maureen, you got number oh, two. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you're ready to start scanning and would like to purchase a good scanner. So I have several different scanners. Um, the sheet fed scanners, I have one of those as well, but those are the, sh so let's talk about two different scanners. There's a flatbed scanner. I recommend something with a flatbed because you can scan all types of photographs, even negatives with it, glass plate negatives included. Um, and I like my Epson's, the V series is very good. They come in a wide variety of price price range is pretty wide variety. Um, I have a scan snap, which is probably what they have at the FHL, which is a sheet fed scanner. That is good for those 20 late 20th century snapshots. The one on resin coated paper, they just slide right through. Uh, but if you, you, if you try to use them for heritage photos, which I consider anything on a cardstock or anything before say 1940, I can't guarantee it won't damage the images. So a flatbed scanner is slow, but uh, you will get good quality with that. If you'd like it, since I was talking about negatives, I can just mention, you always want to say the negatives. I, you know, as growing up when I was younger, I'm always got like, oh, negatives are clutter. They just take up space. Not until I got into the actual archiving and trying to save all this stuff. I wish I would have kept all of the negatives, but we, we kept most of them. And digitizing them now is wonderful, but just imagine what happens in 10, 20 years with better digital tools. You wanna to go back to the original printing plate, a plate per se, and that's what the negative is. You don't wanna go off of a copy of something because you know once you copy something and you copy that and you copy it again, things start to deteriorate, it's not as high quality. You always wanna go back to the source. The source is the negative, don't get rid of those. In fact, we put our negatives in our safety deposit box to make sure they are kept super safe because those are really the source of the originals that you want to keep. Absolutely correct. Uh, that we call it generations. So the first generation is the best. You don't want to go second generation, third generation, fourth generation. You don't want to keep making copies. You lose, you lose picture quality. All right. What other questions we have? Identifying. I think this is you, Maureen. <laughs> That is, how can I tell cased images apart? So if you have a shiny, and I didn't put one on my desk to show you, but if you have a shiny reflective image that you have to hold at a 45 degree angle to see, it's probably a daguerreotype. If you have something that you can look straight on at, it's probably an amber type. And if you uh, have a tin type, it's hard to tell a uh, an amber type and a tin type apart, but tin types are magnetic. Uh, how can you research the photographer? I advise everyone to Google the name of the photographer just to see if there are any, one, other images out there by the photographer, two, if somebody has already written about the photographer, uh, and then three, what you should do when researching a photographer is use the city directories for that. And is there any way to improve a photo to see it more clearly? You know, if you had asked me even five years ago, I would have said, no, not really. But now we have photo tools and I'm amazed at what you can do and what these photo tools can do. You've got the My Heritage Enhancement, which really does a great job on faces. Uh, and then they have the colorizing tools, one to restore color on color photographs if they're shifted and one to add color to images. And then you have Vivapix Restore, which enhances images as well. You can turn it from a black and white to a sepia. Um, it sharpens everything. There's tools within the platform to help you uh, tweak that. There's just some amazing, amazing tools on the market. Uh, hopefully you've caught 
my webinar on tools to help you see your photos more clearly. It's really um, amazing, Maureen. The, the, it's amazing. The, the improvements that we've had in the last year with uh, people using technologies and different patents to, you know, even enhance all different sort of family uh, historian type of tools for photos. And, and that's just today. I can only imagine what five years from now is going to be too, because that's why you want to make sure you keep a lot of your original stuff, because then you never know what can be used for in more enhanced technology in the future. Exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, someone would say, oh, I have this photograph that shifted red. And pretty much the only thing you could do is maybe fix it in Photoshop or you tossed it. But now you don't have to. Now you can fix it. All right. So we're moving Nancy. To the Nancy show. Organizing. Okay. Um, if I have my own folder structure and a family member gives me a copy of their photos in their own very different way of organizing photos, what's the best way to fold these into my own folder structure? Um, so that's a great question. And what you can do is you can, if it fits into your existing structure, like if you've used dates as your highest level folder and then have used a series of albums or families, if it fits into your existing structure neatly without really kind of making it fall apart, then I would go ahead and add it that way. And if it doesn't, then I would start with a whole new um, structure um, and label it maybe, you know, whatever that family name is or whatever the highest level umbrella you could organize it under and then just start a separate stream because it's probably just going to be really too hard to consolidate them and make it work in your system. Um, question two, I have multiple backups of my photos organized and stored on my computer and external drives. Why would I put these on the cloud? And that's a really great question. We get asked this a lot. And I think that, and Maureen definitely weighing in on this one as well, but I think, you know, the rule of having things in as many places as possible where it makes sense to be able to manage and afford it always makes sense having all these um, different copies of it, as long as you can maintain it and make sure that it's up to date in terms of um, the number of images that they're all complete and also metadata. But the other really big advantage about the cloud is that it's just not a physical structure um, in terms of you're not managing a device, you're not managing um, a computer, it's um, backed up. And if you use a really good cloud source or a platform that uses a cloud source as its storage, it is backed up in so many different places across the world, across the country, so that you really have a very, not fail safe because nothing is ever 100% guaranteed, but is as tight a backup and recovery system as there is possibly out there right now. So that's a huge bonus um, um, for using the cloud. Yeah, and if your external hard drive crashes, your computer crashes, you're done. You don't have anything. Or if they're both in the same spot and heaven forbid there's a, you know, a natural catastrophe or a fire, you don't have it anywhere else. That's why having multiple backups to me is, is key, but I like to be able to use it on the computer. It's quicker sometimes, but you don't want to ever lose your stuff once you have it. No, no, you don't. You want to avoid that at all costs. All right. Um, do we want to get to some of these slides? Oh, no, we have, why don't you click another slide, Chris? All right. So we're going to get to all your questions on the right, but we do want to thank you for attending this. We have, I don't know, maybe 20 questions over on the right-hand side in the chat. But we have a special offer called the Unlock the Shoebox Bundle. Uh, I call it the Digital Photo Organizing Bundle. Uh, you'll get an email about that tonight. But it's a three-part masterclass that Nancy and I gave called Getting Started with Photo Digital Photo Organizing, and it includes a three-month subscription to MemoryWeb, which, if you are already a subscriber, can be added to your existing subscription. Um, this is on sale for $59.99. It usually sells for um, $79.98. And you'll get more details about that. Uh, in a little bit, but shall we go to just show our faces, Chris, and then we can jump into the questions? Yeah, well, we're going to be, we were showing our faces, but it was just a smaller version. Yeah, we did little tiny ones. And then here's how you can follow and contact us, mine and Memory Web. We're on all the platforms, um, even unfortunately on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm gonna try to get to stop sharing. Maureen is. More, Memory Web is not. Maureen no, Memory Web is not yet. Yeah. <laughs> not yet. 
All right. I'm working on the stop sharing, Maureen. But we oh, hold go. on. I can uh, do that for you. Right. There yeah. you go. Whew. All right. So I'll be the one uh, reading the questions um, just to make it easier. So we have a question from Pat. Once I have grouped and digitized my photos, what should I do first? Clean up, enhance the photos, fading, cropping, etc., or add the metadata with memory web? I would say that you should uh, clean them up and enhance them. It's just a lot easier to do that first. Plus you also might find that you might wanna create multiple versions of a photo or even consolidate and, and eliminate a few photos. So it's easier to do that on the front end and then add the metadata. And some um, places like a VividPix, if you use that to um, enhance it, um, we'll actually let you add some metadata there. And if you brought it into MemoryWeb, we would read the metadata from that file. I agree, fix them first, then upload them. Uh, Carol, I think we answered your question, Carol, but we'll just review that, which is Carol inherited 15 boxes of slides. Please help me understand how to rescue those. I think we mentioned, I think all three of us could say at the same time, scan them, <laughs> right. digitize them first, <laughs> uh, either doing it yourself, which will take a lot of time or sending them out to a service. And, you know, you can use any service, but, uh, scan my photos. I also had Mitch the owner of um, Scan My Photos on my podcast, um, if anyone's interested. Agreed. And we have another question on slides from Karen. She has her dad's, her aunt's, and her slides to save. What's the best way? Digitize, then um, metadata. Yeah, you know, the other thing I was just gonna mention on slides, a lot of times the, um, the magazines that they come in, people have taken the time to write down the details. I like to make sure that when you do the scanning, whatever group it's in, you maybe take a photo or something of the magazine because that is becoming metadata once you actually are able to then do that next phase. But you don't want to lose any of the stuff. And sometimes they'll write a around the slide, people write on that. Yeah. You don't want to lose that either. So it's just finding a way to make sure you don't lose that information when you go to digital because that's some of the, you know, behind the shoebox or marine your five tips of who, what, where, when, why that you you want to grab once you get to the digitization uh, stage. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Grace from Grand Junction, Colorado. I think they got a ton of snow the other day. Uh, I have too many, I have boxes, I have many archival boxes of recent 1940s to 1990s photos that came before I began getting my photos digitized. Uh, they're in year order, and I am sure that there are duplicates to boot. Any tips on digitizing these or just leave them as prints and give them to the kids? It's, um, so we, when we first started you know, getting into doing all the digitization, it began, it becomes a monstrous task when you have photos from 1940s to 1990. That's scary. One of the things that I also found that works really well is taking those to your local Photoshop because they would love the business to digitize them for you. And you can actually have them organized in your different years or something like that. So they organize them that way on CDs. And you can then actually physically drop them off versus sending them and then physically pick them back up. What that also allows you to do is talk with them and find out what DPI you want. But I would say make the investment in having at least those digitized as prints, if you don't have the negatives for them, obviously. And then figuring out then whatever clues you had and the way that they were organized with any sort of metadata that's on the back, because one of the things you can request done is that if there's handwriting on the back, scan both sides so that they're in sequential order, because there's different platforms such as memory web that can join the front and the back so that that then is not lost. And it's part of that digital archive. Right. This is this era of photos is actually the one you can use the sheet fed scanner for too, which goes very, very quickly. So you can do some of it yourself if you're not comfortable leaving the house um, and actually going someplace. Um, Good tip. Uh, this, somebody says they have a lot of unidentified photographs and it's hard to figure out the dates. Well, do I have information for you or what, Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> I have blog posts and podcasts available on iTunes and Spotify and Amazon Music. Uh, but also, you can just reach out to me through my website. I have a lot of handy guides to help you with that and more classes um, all the time that are being offered to help people do that. Um, this is a question for me from Sandy. Could information related to your numbering inventory that was mentioned in parts one and three 
uh, is that where I scan everything and use one number and then I can go in and change that number later, but it's the computer number I think we were talking about, Nancy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the 001, 002, 003, uh, it just helps uh, in the beginning before you've actually added all that information into the file name. It can help you to tell two photos apart even. Um, Karen has an old photo album that was one of her grandmothers or her great grandmothers, both from Germany. And I don't know which one, how to figure out which one. Uh, Karen, I'm happy to help you with that. If you're interested in a photo consultation, we can talk specifically about that album and how to um, tell them apart. But basically, I think uh, to date the images, the whole album story is something different that would be covered in my class in May. Uh, but to date the images, I would start by seeing what people are wearing and uh, judging how old they are in the picture because then that might help you figure out which generation it is. Um, because maybe the grandmother wasn't the, you know, the right age to be that person in that photo at that time. Um, slides. That's the most common question today. I think, uh, I think people got a lot of slides over the last... I time. think people got a lot of yeah. slides. <laughs> all these discoveries of uh, being able to have more time to organize your house and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we found all these slides. What yeah, we, we, we opened the closet. Uh, Jamie, uh, I'm starting a project to preserve all the negatives I've inherited. <laughs> How should I go about digitizing these? Also, I see a lot of info about different types of photos out there, amber types, carte de visites, etc., but not a lot about different types of negatives. And I notice I have a lot of different sizes. I think you just gave me an idea for a blog post, Jamie. Uh, there are lots of different negative sizes. There are uh, glass negatives. There are actually the first negatives are paper negatives. Then there are glass negatives of two different types. Then there are a wide variety of film negatives in different sizes. Um, and the only type of negative you don't want to deal with are nitrate negatives. But if you just Google <laughs> nitrate negatives, you'll find lots of interesting YouTube videos of them being on fire. Uh, but <laughs> pretty much all the other negatives. Are you, other, are, you, are, you on, are you a YouTuber where you do that? Do you also yeah, no, I'm not making those videos. I'm, you just can watch them. Okay. <laughs> that, that was the old I'm advice sure. when I was curating. That's what you used to do. But paper negatives, hardly anyone has. But a lot of people have the dry plate negatives. And you can scan those on a flatbed scanner. Um, you can scan your negatives on a, a scanner as well. They come with attachments or there's actually YouTube videos out there showing you how to make a negative holder uh, to scan some of the odd size negatives. Um, so definitely worth checking out. But Jamie, I'm going to put that on my list of blog posts to write in the next little bit. Um, oh, James would like the replay available for more than five days. Uh, we actually talked about this a while ago and we're not sure if we're going to do it or not, but we were thinking about offering this unlock the shoe box again later in the year, uh, because we know that the roots tech videos are up for an entire year. So we figured we'll get a new audience, more questions, and certainly you'd be happy to join us for this again. We'll just keep you on the invite list. Uh, but I could leave it up for, uh, 10 days. James, how's that? Um, Double the time. No, double the time. Um, what else we got? How does photo organizing differ between Memory Web and Lightroom? Nancy? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a amazing. question for Nancy. Yeah, no, that's a great question too. Um, I'm actually working with a couple people on their um, Lightroom collections and getting them into Memory Web right now. Lightroom's a fantastic tool. Um, you can add, you can certainly physically modify your photos and it's a really good platform for that. So if it can work in conjunction really well with a platform like Memory Web or others um, because you can physically edit it. Um, you can also add metadata. All the types of tags that you might want to add are there. Um, I think it's not quite as intuitive as um, things that are not built for um, managing photos in terms of the physical side. I think there's so many um, bells and whistles on those that they can be a little bit more cumbersome to navigate, but there's still so much great functionality that you can still, you know, modify physically and edit metadata. 
Um, the other thing is that it's not built for family history. Um, so a platform like memory web is really meant for certainly job number one, get your photos digitized, get them in good shapes, so they're visible. Next job is add metadata. And that's where memory web really then comes to life where you can add metadata really easily, but then you also can create different ways of looking and interacting with your photos. Like if you have an album of photos that you scanned that was from relatives who emigrated from Europe and you've tagged all these photos and um, both from the dates and the locations, you can play with these photos on an interactive world map and kind of trace them around the world. Um, you can also interact with the photos to go then to somebody's um, profile. Um, because we have people profiles that show every photo, every location, every album, and then also family trees. So it's really more of a um, family history uh, collaborating and storytelling, and then also certainly preserving because everything will come out um, from Memory Web 2 in terms of metadata. But that's really kind of the difference. Um, it's very focused on family history and storytelling. And the biggest difference, Memory Web is so easy to use. Thank you. <laughs> and, it, and Lightroom is not. <laughs> uh, Jamie also has a question. Could you interleave archival tissue paper between the pages of an album um, to protect and buffer the photos from the black paper? You could, as long as it's very, very thin archival tissue, but you have to con be con uh, concerned about bulk and maybe breaking the binding of your album. So most curators don't recommend that any anymore. Uh, Karen has a question, what type of portable external hard drive would you recommend for a MacBook Pro? Karen, I am the Mac environment in this relationship here on the screen. Uh, I have an SSD drive and I back up everything to the cloud as well, to um, iCloud. So that I have it in two places. Um, having lost everything early in my a computer career, I don't want to do that again. Oh, yep. Only takes one loss. Mm -hmm. It was when I was writing a book and I lost the whole thing and had to start over. Oh. Uh, we have 11 questions in here. That's an interesting one at the bottom. Oh, we did the black paper one already. Yeah. If you don't want to send away slides and negatives, what's the best way to scan them? So I think we answered that, right? You can get an mm -hmm. attachment or you can buy a little slide scanner. I think Kodak sells them. Not the best resolution, but they're better. Uh, what type of flatbed scanner? I believe we covered that as well. Uh, can I save TIFF photos from both an iPad and a PC to the same portable hard drive to MemoryWeb or Permanent.org? Can Vivipix export directly to an account in MemoryWeb? So you can save a TIFF photo um, both from an iPad and a PC. You can upload in a TIFF file into MemoryWeb. We also take files like raw files as well. Um, permanent, I'm not sure if they accept TIFF. They do. I, I think they, they do. do. Great. Um, so. Yeah, so both of those would. Um, and then can VividPix export directly into an account? Um, there's not a direct sync, but if you save it, uh, VividPix saves onto your computer. And if you use the desktop uploader on MemoryWeb, you can have that um, set to actually automatically upload photos um, if you point it to a particular folder or, or folders of photos. So if you had saved one, it would automatically upload the next time you pop open your computer. Right, and when you save an image in VividPix, it always saves it in the vivid there's a folder called vivid within the folder of the, where you have the images so that's kind of handy too yeah, that's nice oh we did that the numbering any thoughts on using archival boxes versus albums or polyester pages in binders for preserving organizing photos either works just fine uh, but when you use the pages in the binders, just bear in mind that the pictures have a tendency to fall out. Um, if you tip the album the wrong way, I have that problem with my postcard collection, which is a local history collection. Postcards are always falling out of the pages and then I have to, you know, put them all back. Um, Does this mean polyester is coming back, Maureen? Is that what I'm taking out of it? Polyester pages, non-PVC. <laughs> Let's hope polyester <laughs> never comes back. For fabric. <laughs> when you send off slides to be converted, do they add any identification to the file name? 
Not that I know. And actually, one of the things, Maureen, with the external sources, we actually allowed them to then put the file names in the actual groupings that we asked for. Oh, so good. They can do that, but it was an additional service, but it was totally worth it. So I think it depends upon the provider because it's additional lift. But if they're willing to help you organize in the way that you might have brought them to them, they can help with that, which I think you just might as well ask about it if you can. Yeah, yeah. It depends on who you use. Yep. Uh, should we be concerned about retaining copyright for images we upload to a photo organizing platform? Uh, depends on the platform. Um, most of the paid services are going to have um, you own your things and um, that the platform would not have any rights to those whatsoever. Um, if you're using a free service, there may be some language in there that they could potentially um, use them, but I think the majority of them would not that I am aware of, but you should just read the terms and you'd, you'd find out that way. It I depends. Put a little differently because like, you... what if you're the one that is the one that you want to have your stuff copyrighted and can you add that also with the metadata as you then organize it and then maybe send it to other platforms too. So, I mean, I think that's something that, you, you know, you guys have a memory web where it allows you to actually, you know, inject into the copyright and other fields, you can inject the metadata for that. So when it's shared to other platforms, that's going to be read. Right. Sure. Yep. Different, yep. different ways to look at yep. it, different options. Hopefully we yeah. answer it when, we, yeah. <laughs> when we're for the I other. have a third way. Katie <laughs> <laughs> Maureen. Uh, what is the process for editing the metadata? Hmm. That's, Where that's do we a, begin? That's a broad question. Well, I think I think it's so it, easy. It, it, it <laughs> is, but I think it, just to put it in perspective, if someone were to use their phone and take a photo of an old photo, or when you actually go to scan an image, guess what metadata that you get when well, you get the date scanned and the location you're at, if you happen to be using a, a smartphone, that's probably not the actual date, location, or people or any of that stuff that's in there. So you want the ability to modify and change that. And in fact, um, I'm part of a working group that's actually a, a Roots Tech presentation for Family History Metadata Working Group, where a bunch of us from many different companies, including Voodpix, Family Search, Permanent, have come together to talk about how do you, uh, and Maureen, well, Maureen's been the big piece on helping put the standards together too. <laughs> and we've been working on doing exactly that is not only allowing the editing of it, but putting the standards together so that they can be shared amongst platforms. And so each of the platforms that you're able to use now, you, you're able to add or you know have the core metadata that would be needed for those photos to be there. Now the question is that they're linked together and brought in, brought into the actual fields so that those photos, when they move from one platform to the next, are portable. So whether you use Memory Web to do that or Lightroom or uh, many of the other you know, platforms out there, the key thing is that they're all supportable. Because if you think about it, if you have stuff in your Google or your Facebook, a lot of that metadata never leaves when you take photos out. And it's very difficult, but you want to make sure whatever platform you use to add it, they're portable. And that's that's a big key piece of this. Right. And you also want to look at whatever interface the platform gives you, that there's very specific fields, not just um, open text kind of keyword fields. So if you're designating a date, it's an actual date field. If you're designating a person mm -hmm. or um, other things, locations, that it's it's not just text. It's actually like linked up with GPS coordinates, things like that. And that's when your um, tagging actually turns into useful metadata. So basically what happens then is like for the example, the scanned version of the date and location, now that photo is going to have the correct version. So when it's brought to another platform, it's read as if the photo was taken on the actual date of the photo or it was correct. taken at the actual location. That's the beauty of being able to uh, modify metadata with different platforms like that. Right, but if you're using Memory Web, for instance, and you open your photo, then it's really easy to edit that metadata. You just click Edit, and it all shows up, and then you can add or subtract um, what you're doing. Uh, there is a question relating to photo organizing software and metadata, which is, I have scanned thousands of old photos and placed the dates at the start of each, 2021-03-16, would love to have that date become part of the metadata. Okay, so it's part of the file name? Yeah. Um, so uh, when you upload into a platform, I know in MemoryWeb, definitely I, others may as well, 
Um, we import the name as well of the file and it's visible, but it's also searchable. So if you wanted to do a keyword search and put that text in there, you'd be able to find um, individual photos. Um, and then you can actually, a new feature um, that um, we released recently is being able to edit the file name. So you'd be able to change the file name to, um, um, you know, do anything, um, you know, change that file, but also you can add the date from there as well. And if you had a whole group, one of the things that's really nice is if you had a whole group of photos that had a date like 1941 as part of that name, you'd be able to find all those photos at one time, select them all because we have bulk tagging, um, and be able to change the date all at the same time for those. Bulk, bulk tagging is a game it's changer a to me because you know, if, if in the person's example here, it sounds like they took a lot of photos today since today is the 16th. So they take a lot of photos today. They were able to search it in memory web and they found 15 of them. People are used to doing one at a time and tagging to be able to select all and change the metadata for all of the tags at one time, I think is a really helpful thing. And that way you actually have both because you have it in the title still, but then now you have it as far as actually changing the date of the metadata in the actual date created piece. Yeah. Uh... Is there any way to remove the MyHeritage watermarks from enhanced photos on their website after they are downloaded to your personal computer? You can edit them out using a photo editing program. Uh, you have to actually crop the image, I believe, or you can use an Adobe Photoshop method to sort of fill in where it is. But that is valuable information showing that that picture was enhanced or colorized. And so, you know, you, you want future generations to know um, that you've tinkered with that image and that's not like real history it's imagined history based on the algorithm now we mentioned that we have a uh, sale the digital photo organizing also known as unlock the shoebox sale which I'm putting that in the chat if you're interested it is the getting started with digital photo organizing three-part class that Nancy and I taught um, earlier this year last year and then a three-month subscription to memory web which can be added to your existing subscription now does any yep there it is now does anyone have any questions it's on my website the home page as the digital photo organizing sale uh anyone have any more questions for us before we sign off uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us today it's been amazing uh to see we had 50 people live asking us questions uh, and we've been on for 45 minutes plus. <laughs> Could you do a blog post comparing Collectionaire, Memory Web, Permanent? Oh my goodness, they're all different, but I could sort of describe what they all are. Oh, we have one last minute question. If I use Memory Web for family photos that I want to keep and share and also keep them in general photo files that are not organized in as much detail, can they be moved back and forth, like from Dropbox to and from Memory Web? You can download them. You can, yeah. And, and the great thing is that they'll come with any metadata that you've added inside Memory Web, even if you do nothing other than just put them into an album. Um, they'll still be downloaded with that album um, information. And I think one of the key things that people like probably don't realize, and I and I found because of you know having memory web and using memory web all the time is that you change then different uh, album names and different collection names and you might get more details over time. So that's why it's, you know, keeping it in that platform is great because then the metadata is also kept up to date, but making a backup, just as we do mm -hmm. lots of backups, you can take a backup and take it all out with all the metadata and put it into a Dropbox or somewhere else as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to end the broadcast. It will be available for 10 days. Um, and you'll get an email in a little while just thanking you for attending and uh, again, telling you about the sale that we're having. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Maureen. Bye.